I see that all the time. I have never found that to be useful advice. Forget the first hundred words. You can't treat random people as tutors. Today, I want to talk about 25 tips to learn a foreign language. This is based on a blog post written by Mark Manson. Someone pointed out that this was a, an interesting collection of tips for language learning. So I thought it would be interesting to go through these 25 tips and give you my take on these tips, how relevant, how useful they are. Bear in mind that language learning is very personal. So what I like or dislike may not be the same as what you like or dislike or what Mark Manson likes or dislike. His first tip is conversation, conversation, conversation. Now he was, I think, living in Buenos Aires and faced with the difficulty of communicating with locals. So in that situation, if you're in a country where the language is spoken and you need to learn that language, of course, you take advantage of every opportunity to use the language. However, as a strategy for learning the language, I have never considered conversation, at least in the initial stages, to be the key because you can't have a conversation if you don't understand what the other person is saying. So I am much more inclined to prefer heavy input based approach to language learning and wait until you have a high enough level of comprehension to where you can have adult conversations with people. And at that point, yes, you do need to speak a lot. The second thing he says is intensity of study trumps length of study. Well, intensity, yes. And I do remember when I was learning Mandarin Chinese, I had three hours a day, one on one with the teacher. And then I would spend five or six or seven hours on my own listening and reading and writing and learning characters. And I learned in one year faster than other diplomatic students as with the Canadian government in Hong Kong, who, who took two years and learned less well. So I, I remember I came to the conclusion at that time that creating that white heat in your brain that comes from intensity, is very helpful, but we continue to learn. So even after a period of very intense learning, it continues to gestate in your brain and there are other opportunities to use the language and you are always improving over a long, long period of time. Number three, he says classes suck and are an inefficient use of time and money. One-on-one -on -one, as the way I had it in Hong Kong with a teacher, a new teacher every hour, forcing me to say something in the language. I think that was very good, very intense. However, sitting in a classroom with 10 people, with a teacher, especially if you have to travel a half hour or 45 minutes to get to the class, the classes are expensive. In my case, the government was paying. If I had to pay for that myself, I wouldn't do it because we can achieve so much on our own listening and reading and then eventually finding an opportunity to use the language. Number four, know your motivation for learning a new language. That's important. I was listening to a podcast, How Stuff Works or something, to Americans and they were saying, why would you learn a language? Is it just for showing off? No, that's, I don't think why most people learn languages, but it may be the case for some. So you have to look at yourself. Am I learning this language to show off? Am I learning to communicate with my grandmother? Am I learning it because I need it for work? Am I learning it because I'm interested in the culture? It's important to understand why you're doing it because there are a lot of moments during the process when you are discouraged because you don't think you're getting anywhere and you have to go back to like, why am I actually doing it? So that's a good point. Number five, he says, set learning goals. Well, I've said that in a general sense, my goal always is B2 on the European common framework of reference, which is kind of fluent with mistakes and places where you don't understand. That to me is the goal. Once you're there, you can continue to improve, but I very often don't achieve that. I move off a language where I'm still at A2 and I go to another language because I'm interested in it. So to me, at my stage, the goals aren't that important. When I was a Canadian government language student in Hong Kong learning Mandarin Chinese, I had a very specific goal. I had to write the British Foreign Service exam and I said I want to do that within a year. So that was a very specific goal for a specific purpose. That's not the situation now and the goal will dictate what you do. Are you going to spend a lot of time writing? Are you going to maintain a diary? All the different things that you can do, many of which are hard work. If your goal is high enough, you will have the discipline to do these things. If you're more of a dilettante like me, you'll be more of a lazy language learner like I am. Next thing he says, start with the most common words, the hundred most common words. I see that all the time. I have never found that to be useful advice. If you are doing a lot of listening and reading or even speaking, you will encounter the most common 100 words, 500 words very, very often. However, the 
frequency declines very quickly and the major challenge thereafter is going to be acquiring the less frequent words but the most common words they look after themselves you needn't worry about it and if your goal is to learn the most common hundred words so that you can go and start talking to someone you will find i think in many in most cases that you won't be able to follow the conversation anyway because the person you're speaking to is not going to limit what they have to say to the hundred most common words number seven he says carry a pocket dictionary i never carry a pocket dictionary but dictionaries are very inefficient it takes time to find a word you forget what the meaning was as soon as you close the dictionary i just find you know you end up saying how do you say this how do you say that could you please repeat and you kind of struggle through if you have that kind of a rudimentary conversation i prefer to prepare myself through lots of listening and reading and then hope for the best so i don't carry a pocket dictionary number eight keep practicing the new language in your head again i never do that not deliberately now it may be that subconsciously i have these phrases bouncing around in my head but i don't deliberately try to practice the new language in my head i just don't do that that's not to say it's not a good thing to do it's just not something that i can you know do you're going to say a lot of stupid things i accept it yeah i'm not sure it's stupid but we are comfortable in our own language typically we feel we are if we're adults we think we're adult we think we're intelligent we think we can express ourselves and all of a sudden in a new language we can't we make mistakes we can't find the words in a way it's unpleasant although there is the sort of compensating sense of achievement when in fact you are able to say something you are able to understand you get this tremendous power but yeah there are certainly periods of uncertainty and you have to accept that number 10 he says figure out pronunciation patterns and he makes reference to Slavic languages and Romance languages which have certain patterns I would rather hear say when it comes to pronunciation focus on intonation if you can get the intonation of a language the rhythm of the language then the pronunciation is going to improve your correct usage is going to improve you should you know listen to that intonation and try to imitate it number 11 he says use audio and online courses for the first hundred words and basic grammar well, I've covered the first hundred words. I don't think that's important. They'll come at you anyway. Basic grammar, again, it's hard to nail down the basic grammar. You'll be struggling with basic grammar for a long, long time. He mentions various apps. He doesn't mention Link, unfortunately. Fine, yeah, there's all kinds of apps and tools and resources online that are going to help you, but the focus should be on acquiring the language, not necessarily just the first hundred words, not necessarily the basic grammar. Both of those things are going to continue to elude you for quite a while. Number 12, he says, after the first hundred words, focus on becoming conversational. Again, I don't know what that means. You are not going to be conversational with a hundred words. Forget the first hundred words even forget trying to be conversational at an early stage focus on improving your comprehension acquiring vocabulary speak when you have the opportunity you're not going to be comfortably conversational until you have a sufficient vocabulary and a sufficient level of comprehension he says aim for the brain melt sure i think i understand what he's saying go at it as intensively as you can and you will be engaging with the language it's kind of occupying your every waking moment and interestingly whatever you've done before going to bed or during the day during the sleeping hours that is being reinforced and put into your long-term memory so the more intense that experience the bigger the brain melt i guess the faster you're socking it into your brain use a new language daily only in the sense that listening and reading are also using the language it's simply not practical to be speaking daily but you should try to maintain some consistency of engaging with the language and so that's certainly good advice number 15 how do you say x is the most important sentence you can possibly learn again i don't agree with that how do you say x is not difficult to say you will learn that early but it's not a major help I think you'll find yourself saying, I beg your pardon, could you repeat that more often? Because when we speak, we tend to limit ourselves to what we can say and the words that we have. Number 16, he says, one-on-one -on -one tutoring is the best and most efficient use of time. It's the best and most efficient type of tutoring or classroom learning one-on-one. -on -one. I don't believe in sitting with a group of five or six or 10 and taking turns conversing some are better than others not an efficient use of time but i think that listening reading or dare i say using link can be at least as efficient a use of time as one-on-one -on -one tutoring but you need a mixture you need them all the tutor is stimulating it's feedback it's, it's all good number 17 date someone who speaks the target language 
and not your native language, uh, I'm married. So it doesn't apply. You're selectively, you know, removing anyone who speaks English if your native language is English. Harder to find. I'm not sure how relevant that is as a activity. 18. If you can't find someone cute who will put up with you, find a language buddy online. So with the language buddy is, again, I have to spend time teaching that person my language, English. So that's an hour for every hour I get of speaking to them in my target language. I would rather spend more time with input activities and then pay $10, $15, $20 an hour for an online tutor when I want. Facebook chat plus Google Translate equals winning. Again, I'm not on Facebook. I don't have any interest in Facebook. Uh, Google Translate is useful for written communication. I think it's a little cumbersome trying to use it for oral communication. Number 20, when you learn a new word, try to use it a few times right away. Again, a big part of language learning to me is that it be natural. I acquire so many words through listening and reading. I can't possibly use them all right away. There's no opportunity to use them. There's a gradual process where words that we have seen and we're starting to become familiar with eventually become passive vocabulary and eventually become active vocabulary. I don't think you can short circuit the process by trying to use them right away. And if you do, you'll only slow down your acquisition of a richer and richer passive vocabulary, which is a base that you need for comprehension. And it's the base upon which all other language skills are built. So no, don't try to use it right away. 21, he says, TV shows, movies, newspapers, magazines are good supplements, but he says ultimately nothing compares to the benefits of speaking, like conversations. Again, I don't agree with that because if you're into TV shows, movies, newspapers, and magazines, you're expanding your horizons, getting used to that new language and everything associated with it. If you limit yourself to what you can say, it becomes a much more limited experience. And I don't think it, that's a good long-term strategy. Number 22, most people are helpful, let them help. Yeah, most people are helpful, but that French girl who went to Norway, she makes the point and it's very important, you know, make sure you're good before you get there. So if you go to Norway and you aren't very good in Norwegian, as helpful as I am sure the Norwegians are, they're going to speak to you in English because they think they're being helpful by speaking to you in English. So you can't treat random people as tutors. Uh, you have to get yourself to a level where people are comfortable speaking to you in the language that you're trying to learn. And number 23, there will be a lot of ambiguity and miscommunication. Yes, of course there will. That comes with the territory, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, uncertainty that's part of learning a language and we shouldn't let it bother us. 24, these are the phases you go through to learn a foreign language. I mean, you can describe the phases any way you want. In my view, we have initial success because from zero, suddenly we understand a few things. We're able to say a few things. Then we go through a phase where we feel we're not making any progress whatsoever because there's so many low frequency words that we need in order to understand the movie, in order to have meaningful conversations. And then all of a sudden we turn a corner and we have this feeling of, wow, I'm somewhere, I'm B2. And these phases may be different for different people, but there is a gradual process of working towards success, however we define it. And finally, he says, number 25, find a way to make it fun. I would not put that as finally, I would put that as upfront. Figure out a way to enjoy the process. And at every stage, and we talked about stages, enjoy the process. So I, for example, at an early stage, uh, I find it enjoyable to listen to our mini stories over and over again. Comes a point where I can no longer do that because we need repetition, but we need new things. And so I find it enjoyable to move onto things that are difficult where I'm meeting some of the same words and phrases, but in many different contexts, and I'm learning about many things through the language, and I find that enjoyable. Obviously, when I have an opportunity to use the language, if I'm in the country, or if I hear someone speaking a language that I've been learning, I'll immediately pounce on them and speak to them. And so that's also enjoyable. So it's important at every stage to find ways to enjoy the process, not just finally, but e even at the very beginning. Everyone has their own approach to language learning. If it works for them, that's all that matters. And I'm going to leave with you two videos that I would suggest you have a look at talking about the importance of input, because I think that's crucial. And that kind of underlies my philosophy of language learning. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.